Nicolino and Gary Halbert. Um, this is our uh, podcast on uh, public service, and we're going to talk with the former CEO of the Port of San Diego and the former city manager of the city of Chula Vista. Collectively, I'm not going to say how many years of experience you two have, but it's a lot in government and in public service. So I really wanted to sit down and talk with you and see what lessons you've learned, what led you to government life, uh, what your impressions were, what your greatest achievements, what you're most proud of. Uh, there's really no hard and set fat rules uh, on how to do this, but it's really more of a conversation about, uh, as you look back in your career, what lessons have you learned? What do you want to tell the next generation of public servants? So maybe I'll start with you, Gary. Uh, how did you get into, you know, you and I met some 30 years ago uh, when I was in my early 20s. I'm not going <laughs> to, I think we both had gray hair back then, though. I don't think we ever had. I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sort of I started turning gray in my 20s. That's, that's what local government will do for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how did you, what was your first job in government? Why did you get in there? So I was studying um, systems engineering up at UCSD and uh, found a student job with the city. And I was working in subdivisions, reviewing subdivision maps and parcel maps and then public improvement drawings and, and doing permitting. And um, I actually got my first permanent job at the city of San Diego playing during a card game of hearts. <laughs> it was... And uh, uh, win or lose, is that how you ended up? I, I was a win, that was a definite win. So, I um, ended up working in traffic engineering, and I, I swear I have loved just about every minute that I worked in uh, in local government. So, I started when I was still a teenager and uh, and worked all the way through. It was great, it was awesome. So, okay. did transportation engineering, transportation planning, then got into urban planning. Uh, became the development services director at the city of San Diego, moved on to Santee, and then uh, finished up in, in Chula Vista, first as the planning director and ultimately as the city manager. So while you're, we're on your, your career track, um, how did you make the decision to move around? I mean, sometimes people stay in one agency for 40 years, and that's good. But I think naturally, if people want to get ahead, they find opportunities and they make a strategic jump, hoping that something will open up at another agency. Is that how it generally yeah. worked for you? Um, yes and no. Uh, the, the city of San Diego had gone from a council manager form of government to a strong mayor form of government. And knowing that ultimately if I really wanted to get into city management, um, it frankly made sense to leave the city of San Diego, but I loved what I loved what I was doing, and so it was hard. It was heart wrenching to to leave the city of San Diego and and go out to Santee. But uh, it was a, a very good move, and and you know, frankly, you learn that there's life outside of the city of San Diego. That there are other, there are other cities out there, yeah. um, because it it is, you know, it it's a um, huge huge organization, and uh, there's so many people in there, and and so many wonderful things to do, but when you get outside of it and start to work, you know, and going, going to the point of, you know, work that Rand and I have done together, um, you get outside of an organization, you start to realize um, that there are partnerships to be made. And there's so much that we can do when, when organizations start working with each other. Yeah. Yeah. So it, so it's uh, good to get to some experience in the big city, but sometimes opportunities lie in the smaller cities. Uh, mm -hmm looking for a career track to move around, got it. So Randa, I know you were a chemistry major, right? <laughs> yes. So how did a chemistry major end up in <laughs> all this? Oh gosh, it's a long and winding road. Um, I would just, you know, I do have a degree in chemistry and I'm, I'm not sorry about that. Uh, I just really enjoyed the sciences when I was in college, but then, um, became enamored with real estate in the early 80s. Um, a lot of people were making a lot of money and it kind of made my head spin. And I got my real estate license and I didn't want to wear a mustard yellow jacket and sell homes. So I got a job with a developer and um, anyway, spent the first 20, 15 years of my career, I guess, in commercial real estate. 
um, and then answered an ad in the classifieds. That's how we used to get jobs, yeah. you guys. Yeah. Um, not a website, I, not Indeed. You know, not... Talk to young people now, and they, they're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, it was about uh, the company that I was working for at the time was selling off all their property. And I was in the market for a job. So I answered an ad for a real estate job at the Port of San Diego. And sadly, though I was 40 at the time and a native of San Diego and a graduate of UC San Diego, I think actually Gary and I figured out that we were there at the same time. Um, I had no idea what the Port of San Diego was, but I thought that the ad might as well have had my name in it was calling for me and I applied for that real estate position at the port um, knowing and and that is in the port of San Diego is the only public sector experience I have ever had at mind you it was 21 years of experience but um, I had no idea about the public sector and and it wasn't really an objective of mine to do um, work in the public sector. It just seemed like a really cool real estate job. And it turned out to be a really cool real estate job. Um, I used to always say, and you know, friends and family would ask me, well, what are you doing? You know, why don't you go get a real job? Why are you working for the government? You know, you can't be making much money. And I used to always say that the projects we get to work on at the port, and I think in the public sector in general, probably, are those kinds of career defining and um, transformative for the community kinds of projects that you might sort of have a peripheral role in one sometime during your career in the private sector, but it's all we worked on at the port were these really cool, big um, projects that really changed the waterfront in San Diego. So I, I just fell in love with the work. Hmm. So that's certainly true. And I can attest as a former city of San Diego employee, uh, you know, I actually, I remember something Gary said to me, he said, uh, I always thought you were in a higher position than you were <laughs> because <laughs> Because I was always involved in so many big projects from an early age that yeah. I was initiated into, you know, very big, complex, politically challenging that in my early 20s. And what could you possibly do in your early 20s in any job? You can't, mm -hmm. yeah. That would expose you to this massive, complex, you know, you kind of made you grow up a lot faster, uh, yeah. even though, like you, Randa, my family was saying, what are you doing working for a city, you know, what? That's not something people did, I guess. I, I was 1991. It, no one understood what I did for the government. They just kind of said, you know, oh, he works for the city. So if you had a pothole, got a problem with something. Oh, oh my, my family, my, I think, figured I was at the DMV, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, issuing uh, renewing licenses. I don't know. Yeah. And that's okay. That, that's just what they uh, explained. So, you know, uh, what we're trying to focus on is public service, but obviously we're, you know, and Rand and I had many talks about our objective role. We're just uh, implementing policy. We don't make policy. We don't get into politics. So it was something we at the port aspired to and always worked hard on. We're just staff. We're just professional staff. So in your two agencies, City of Chula Vista Port, you know, how do you, uh, how do you kind of reconcile politics and policy uh, or, or public administration? How do you keep those two apart? Uh, and how do you keep your staff kind of just working on, on public service and not get involved in politics? Is that something you experienced or was it naturally always two separate things? Randy, you can go if you want. I, I would just say, I feel like early on um, at the Port of San Diego, it was two separate things and it wasn't until more recently, I couldn't pinpoint a year or a date that politics really became a big part of uh, decision making and our board meetings and sort of crept into our boardroom. Um, and I think just 
focusing on getting the work done and not the and sort of letting go of the fact that we're the staff and we implement the decisions. We don't make the decisions. We don't get a vote. We don't have a button. You know, we don't we don't get to press the button during the board meeting. Um, was uh, it just an important lesson that everyone had to, you really have to accept that if you're gonna work in, uh, in a political universe, right? Um, unless, unless you wanna be part of that machine, which is okay too, but uh, it's, an important, it's an important thing that you, that you really just have to accept. And I, I will just admit that from time to time, I really, I had a little bit of a hard time with it and felt almost like if I felt uncomfortable with the direction my board might seem to have been going, I really had to just- Let go. You know, <laughs> keep my poker face on and uh, yeah, and go <laughs> and go get it done, right? And, and actually one last thing before I ask Gary the same question is that something we've used to talk about is, you know, you gotta leave your ego outside yeah. uh, as staff, right? If you want big statues built after you and accolades and this is not the job for you. Public yeah, right. service is just about the dispassionate administration of the public's business. Not your opinion, not your business, not any of, and whatever the leaders want, that's what we implement. And a yeah. lot of people, I think sometimes we, even our hiring practices, when I remember being on various uh, hiring uh, boards where we would say, okay, that, that, is that person gonna be a good fit? Are they gonna be able to assimilate into a government administration without always fighting everybody about their ideas? There was no yeah. sort of, bad, you know, good ideas, plenty of good ideas, but uh, we don't get to, we can recommend, but at the end of the day, whatever the bosses say, that's what we do. How was that in the Chula Vista and the mayor former government or in its different cities that you were? Yeah. Um, well, I, I wanna react first to something you said. I don't find public service to be dispassionate at all. I, I find it to be extremely passionate and and people are very passionate about wanting to make a difference in their communities, and go out and do things and, you know, have, uh, whether it's projects or it's filling, you know, individual potholes, whatever it might be, there are good ways of doing it and you get really passionate about it and you get passionate about the people you work with. So, so it's not like, you know, it's, it's not like you, that the politics is the passionate side and being, you know, being part of the bureaucracy is dispassionate. I, I, I feel very strongly the other way around on that. So when I think of politics, it's, especially if you're in upper management, it's extremely important that you're politically savvy. Because if you're not, if you're not reading the flow, you're going to be in for a world of hurt. But it's also very, so it's very important that you be politically savvy and yet be apolitical. So, you know, I would say that, that most, most council members I worked either for or with um, wouldn't know what party I came from. You know, um, some, some would, some wouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's very important, you know, and I'm, I, you know, my career, my whole career has been in local government. It's, you know, the local government tries to be apolitical, it isn't, but it tries. And the, the bulk of the decision-making is actually done by staff. You know, the, the, re, the reality is that, that the council's up there setting policy and setting the, the flow of where they want the city to be heading. But it's the, it's the, it's the staff down to the individual staff members that are making decisions to, to implement that, that flow. And, and as Randa said, yeah, occasionally the council will go off in a, a totally different direction, um, you know, and you just kind of shift, you shift gears and you find the right way to do where they want to go to, because it's, it's just a, it's just a different direction. So, um, you know, and, and I never found, you know, if, if, uh, if we were providing recommendations to council, if they wanted to go a different way, they were always respect, and I won't say that all councils are, but certainly the ones I worked with were always respectful of staff, even if they wanted to go off in a different direction. Yeah. No, I thank you for that um, clarification. I think sometimes when I use the word dispassionate, uh, people may assume that they don't, people don't care about their jobs. 
and it's, it's quite the opposite. Uh, all or the that they're working like 1984, you know, yeah. and it's like, no, no. Or yeah, or, or, or you know, what my, uh, you know, I think a lot of uh, my friends sometimes said, oh, you got a cushy government job. I go, I don't remember ever, anything cushy about it. <laughs> it was challenging from the minute I walked in to the minute I left. There was yeah. nothing easy about it, but I was passionate about public service, just like you guys are, and just like the people in our, that we work with. So that drove me to keep coming back for that challenge, mm -hmm. right? So I just, that's why I did it, you know, because I like being a public servant. I like helping my community. That was what drove me, as, you know, I, I did it for 25 years. You guys collectively did it for, I'm not gonna say how, how many years, Gary? 30? Uh, about 40, 40. 40 years. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Twice as long as I did. Yeah. So, so obviously you don't put up with all of that, that you know, just for either a paycheck or you do it for because you're passionate about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes you just got to, like you say, disconnect. Maybe is another way. Discon be politically savvy, but disconnect from getting involved in, uh, the, in some of the political discussions that should just be happening outside of, you know, staff. Of course, they consult. Mm -hmm professional staff, like all boards, commissions do, they, hey, what's your recommendation, right? They want their recommendation and they can take it wherever they want. There is no, also in my experience, there's no democratic pothole or Republican pothole. <laughs> if something needs to get done in government, it needs to get done. And I thought that was, I thought that was foxhole, Sherry. Yeah, <laughs> foxhole, many is a foxhole, <laughs> which, many of which I've hidden in, in the past in case of, uh, you know, and I, or, I, or I hide behind my bosses, God knows what, but, uh, or maybe, Anyway, but that's another conversation. You know, uh, I'm talking a little bit about diversity and this is kind of my own experience being Iranian American as I grew up in public asset management. I always observed there weren't a lot of uh, African Americans in my field. And I just kind of wondered why, you know, and I participated in a lot of um, educational uh, outreach to the community. I, I did career fairs, I went to different schools, um, you know, I was always happy and very proud to represent my various agencies to kind of show at least my diversity. And of course, you know, uh, at the city of San Diego, much, much bigger organization, 5,000 roughly, I don't know, maybe with the cops is 10,000, I don't know how total employees, but big diversity, big commitment to diversity at the port, also very diverse community. Um, how do you, uh, what is your perspective on diversity in the workforce in the public sector? What is what, what is your observation and what have you seen that worked? Maybe Gary, you can speak to it if you want. Well, it, 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 I've, and having done many of the same things that, that you've done, Shariar, and um, knowing that, that the lack of diversity and it, and it you know, I, I, over the decades that I've worked in, in public service, I've seen the, the organizations become more diverse you know, at all levels within the organization, but they're always lagging the diversity of the community. And, um, and so I think the big driver is um, education because in the, the more professional, the more managerial a position, the less diverse it's going to be. And so we really need to be getting in at the elementary school level and encouraging STEM education. Um, you, you know, at the high schools, doing the doing the fairs at the high school, the career days and things like that. But it's got to be a constant push. And then we need, you know, we probably have hit that point where we need to start really looking at some of our our fundamentals of the civil service system that may be systemically racist to begin with. You know, so our, you know, if if we're using a set of tools to judge who are the best. Um, the best candidates for a particular job, we need to look at those tools. And, and you know, and, and quite honestly, uh, you know, I, I think having, um, you know, that practice of building the KSAs, the knowledge, skills, and abilities that are needed for particular jobs, the, those KSAs may not really be an indicator of who would truly be most successful in those jobs. And I think if we, if we start looking at those again and rethinking some of that, that maybe we'll get a little bit a little bit more acceleration in that push um, to get to, to a, a, a diverse organization that's truly reflective of the community it's serving. Yeah. 
Randa, do you have any thoughts? Uh, no, no, Randa, I'll say you were the first woman to be the CEO of the Port of San Diego. If you look at all the pictures of the guys that came behind you, <laughs> it's your picture, you know? So I think a lot of the community took a great deal of pride in your ascension to that office. And you definitely brought a different perspective uh, and a good perspective uh, in, in shepherding and really a more thoughtful, uh, compassionate perspective in my personal experience. Uh, looking at your organization now, your experience, what is your reaction really to, to the diversification of the port over the past 10, 20 years? Well, first of all, I, you know, I, I have to really agree with Gary about the education piece, um, but I would even take it a little step further and talk about exposing kids and teens and college students to the opportunities in government. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not something, at least when I was in school, we ever really heard about. Um, and I know that a lot of like high school programs have, they don't even teach civics anymore. How are kids supposed to even understand how things happen in the you know, community around them? I don't, I don't really get it. But um, I've often advocated that we develop some kind of curriculum um, to be taught in schools about our local governments and in particularly in San Diego County about the Port of San Diego. No, I grew up here my entire life and never ever knew what the Port of San Diego was. And I think there, that's really common. So um, I would agree with that. I also think diversity, di I have always been very cognizant of the importance of diverse perspectives. So no matter what kind of initiative you're working on or what kind of project you're trying to advance, really getting input from uh, people with diverse points of view or who may experience impacts from that project differently or may have a different um, just different approach to something you're working on. And I think the more complete picture you can get about all the various perspectives, then the better chance for success you have in whatever it is that you're trying to, whatever it is that you're trying to advance or promote. Um, and, and that obviously goes to racial diversity and gender diversity and you know all the different all the different aspects. So uh, those are those are things that I think are really important. I am not sure what the answer is to having the you know the um, like Gary talked about the sort of the the constitution of the folks that work in a particular organization matching the ethnic makeup of that community. I, I don't know how you get there. I think that that is a really big challenge um, and it'll be interesting to see how the leaders of the future uh, tackle that challenge. I just, I, I really don't know. I think it's important to understand where everyone's coming from. I know we had a lot of folks at the port very, very um, worked up emotionally this last year after the George Floyd incident and just managing through that with compassion was um, challenging, I think for me and for our whole executive team. Um, and we did the best we could to listen, to give people an opportunity to express their feelings, share ideas about how we might be able to do a better job at the port. I think we collected 300 some ideas and we, we did some bias, uh, unconscious bias training and a number of other things to try to give people um, a, venue, a venue for venting their frustrations for one thing um, and, and just learn what we could about what, what we could do to improve. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think every person, I hope every agency in the country evolved somehow during this past year, uh, whether they make conscious choices or like good programming that you mentioned, Randa. Uh, uh, 
I think everyone evolved and is continuing to evolve. But I think education and getting back to it, I and mean, this is always one of my randoms right on about, you know, we never quite noticed a, a class on ports in any school or high school. <laughs> that we were, nobody knew, right? And, and in fact, from a, if we just focus on that one niche of let's say real estate, there's no real estate class hardly for public asset. Public, right. 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 Nothing. No, so you know, all of us uh, came from real estate backgrounds, uh, the people that would, we would hire, they would have 20 years of brokerage experience or residential, or useless, can't use it, you know, uh, or the type of investment decisions that, that sometimes you would make in the private sector, it's not what you make in the public sector. You have mm -hmm. hardly any holding costs as in a public sector type situation. So your rate of return is a little different than what you-, what you But make. it's not about maximizing, it's not about maximizing your profit or your bottom line, which yeah, was very right. hard. I have to I have to admit, very hard for me to get used to, right? I would say, what do you mean we're gonna put a park here? That we could add another tower to this hotel. Yeah. So it, it's, um, it's just a completely different, completely different approach. Yeah, I think education is at the core of it. And I think, uh, you know, it's over the past year, I've, I've noticed there's other organizations that are community-based. I think there's something called Mario Logan College Institute. Uh, there's a couple of other uh, institutes that um, kind of are, are small, but they work by leveraging connections with government and other agencies to help train the next batch of young people with more meaningful jobs in the community. Uh, and I'm sure Chula Vista and San, other cities have similar, smaller kind of niche groups. Um, so thank you for covering all of that. That's basically very, very important. Now we're lo I'm looking at kind of life in a post-COVID era. Uh, every city, every jurisdiction we know of has been hit hard with budgets um, and tough choices. Gary, how do you see kind of uh, jurisdictions evolving and adjusting to a life after the COVID hit, S small business, government, everything. I mean, it, it was a big hit. How do you dig yourself out of this? So it's, a, it's not necessarily a big hit. So it depends on what city you are. Um, and if you were a city that, that most, a, a big portion of your, ta of your revenue base was tourism, then that was going to be a, a very big hit for you last year. Um, you know, in in, um, in Chula Vista, I would argue that, you know, people staying home and buying things in Chula Vista and, you know, getting their to-go food from Chula Vista, um, that it probably wasn't as big of a hit as it was to San Diego, and certainly in no way as big of a hit as it was to the Port of San Diego. Um, so when I think of, you know, post-COVID, um, I think of a couple of things. One is that, that there's going to be a, a, a healthy infusion of dollars into, into communities across the board. And as we, as we spend those dollars to you know, kind of reignite our local economies, um, being sure we're doing it through an equity lens. And so um, I think there's a real opportunity there. And, and if, we're, you know, if we just kind of hunker down and say, well, we have all this money, here's all the things we haven't been taking care of, um, that if you just fall into that knee-jerk reaction, you're gonna be missing a big opportunity. So that's one. The other thing is, you know, it, it, we've really seen the digital divide has really glared o over, over this year. And, you know, and, and I remember working on that in Chula Vista and essentially, you know, you'd hear, well, the, there's state and federal dollars available. To, it's like the basis at like five meg, you know, per second, it's like, no, 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 that's not it. You can't, you know, we can't be in a place where kids and adult and learning adults are going to be successful if we treat, you know, the, the digital infrastructure as something that isn't a huge public asset. And you know this working for Verizon, I've had this conversation with you before. You know, if, if, I'm, if I'm a water utility, I may provide lifeline services to the disenfranchised in the community, but I'm not gonna say, well, I'm gonna charge you less for water, but you're gonna get a, a lower grade of water. You're not gonna get quite the good stuff that we give to the people that are paying full freight. You know? so, so how do we get to a place? Cause it's so important. 
Um, so how do we how do we use this opportunity? And you and I'm seeing it at the federal level. A lot of talk up from both parties, bipartisan talk about um, using these infrastructure dollars or, or hopeful infrastructure dollars to begin to attack the, the digital divide. So that's that's huge. And then the last thing is, what have we learned in this past year of, of working distance and working distantly and learning distantly that can help us in our climate change efforts? You know, and, and so I'm not, I wouldn't suggest that we shouldn't still have employees going to city hall but you know having worked in transportation demand management back in the 90s and and trying to do telecommuting um it just wasn't working you know but today with the technology the place it is now i think we can keep some of the cars off the road that are that are we're starting to see back out there again but uh, uh anyway i think so kind of jumping back i'd say the important things to do are as we move forward into the post post COVID world, use these opportunities to to deal with the things that we're going to deal with using an equity lens, mm -hmm. and then you know as ever as ever you know the cliche don't let a good crisis go yeah. you know, yeah. without without learning from it. So those would be the things I'd suggest. Randa, any any perspectives on what's on the horizon? It doesn't have to be just port related, but of course, work through the basis. You know, I, uh, I'm just really interested in watching it all unfold. I, as Gary said, the COVID really, really hit the Port of San Diego hard. I think my heavens every day um, that we had people, that there were leaders long ago that understood the importance of saving for a rainy day. Yeah because it rained and rained and rained. And the only thing that really kept the port going and in business and kept our employees employed was the fact that we had very, very healthy reserves. Yeah. Um, and that, I just, that lesson I think is just embedded very deeply into um, all of us who experienced this last year. I know the port's going to be dipping into their reserves further for the upcoming budget year and hopeful that the year after that things might start to normalize a little bit, but it also gives us a big um, lesson on diversification of our portfolio. The Port of San Diego didn't, does not have the benefit of tax dollars like a city does, like a city of Chula Vista or any other city. So our revenues came only from our operations and in large part, our real estate operations, which are largely um, attached to the tourism market. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think the importance of, of having those reserves, of diversifying our portfolio, um, and of taking care of our employees. I will, I will put that out there as well. I felt very strongly in the beginning when we were putting together our budget for last year and everything was closed down that we needed to do everything we could to keep as many of our employees working um, as we could for as long as we could. And I'm happy that to this up to this point, there haven't been layoffs. Um, and I, I felt very strongly about that. I think uh, it was important and hopefully, knock wood, it stays that way uh, until we see our way all the way out of this. But um, yeah, That's definite lessons. And the working from home thing, I, I think it's, it's a very personal um, situation. I mean, some people handle it well and are equipped to handle it well and have the, have the facilities to handle it well. And some people absolutely hated it. And um, it'll be, I think there's going to always be some component of it. It's so funny because we were actually piloting a telecommuting program just rolling it out literally two weeks before we sent everybody home wow. um, in March of last year. So 
I believe there's a place for it. But I also, like Gary said, I think, you know, people will be going back to work in the court administration building the same way they'll be going back to work at all the city halls all around. Maybe not every person every day. Uh, it might not look the same. I don't think it'll ever look the same as it did uh, pre-COVID. Yeah. So fantastic perspectives, um, all true. Personally, I'm a big fan of telecommuting. I was advocate for it at the city of San Diego. Uh, and especially if you have a family situation that requires a little bit more uh, home time, uh, work flexibility. I think one thing that is going to get embedded in a post-COVID era in any public private sector is people trying to you know, be work part-time or remotely and telecommuting. All that stuff is naturally going to unfold and figure itself out. So last question, you know, uh, your best advice, one single advice for the next upcoming class of public servants. Um, what would you tell yourself 30 years ago, 20 years ago, when you were walking in, what advice would you give your younger self? Gary, you want to go? Uh, well, I would have said have fun and I did. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I guess my one piece of advice would be um, work, focus strongly on your communication skills. That, that, that is so, so important and probably the most important thing uh, moving throughout your career is continuing to work on your communication skills. Yeah, Brenda? I um, have been asked this question before and I spent a lot of time thinking about it. You're ready for I, it. My advice is get stuff done, get a <laughs> reputation for getting stuff done, but don't do it in a way that leaves a trail of broken hearts and dead bodies in your wake. So, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Gary Halbert, Randa Coniglio, for spending some time with us and helping us uh, look back and look ahead. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you. you, Sharia.